Arnold Snyder will be offering two uh, brown bag lunches coming up very soon on, I think, um, January 26th, Wednesday, and February the 2nd, between 12 and 2. So he'll be picking up on this theme of spirituality, spiritual formation, and specifically um, looking at the spirituality of early Anabaptism. And um, let me just give you two little nuggets to, to, that might encourage you to want to hear more from him. Um, he, he, his claim is that the deepest, strongest, richest taproot of Anabaptism found its nourishment in the subsoil of ascetic Christian spirituality. So what's ascetic spirituality? Well, that's this lifestyle of rigorous self-discipline, of uh, simple living. It's a Greek word that they used for athletes when they train or for philosophers who give up all sorts of things so that they can pursue the contemplation of the true, the good, and the beautiful. And so there's a long monastic tradition of asceticism. And we already mentioned Benedict, and we already mentioned Michael Sattler. Uh, Arnold Snyder wrote his doctoral dissertation on Michael Sattler. Michael Sattler was a Benedictine prior in the Black Forest and, um, and what is now Germany. And so, so it's a fascinating, he's done some fascinating work uh, in this regard. And um, I can only recommend that. Uh, so these are lunch hours, I think, between 12 and 2, Wednesdays. And, um, at sorry, at Grable, yeah, at Grable. And I'll just say one more recommendation that he makes. Uh, a lot of these profs are very clear in what has to happen. happen. And his, his angle is he's convinced that Mennonites in the next millennium will uh, rediscover the spiritual mediating power of outward symbols, liturgy, ceremony, and worship, understood and reinterpreted in a believer's church context. So in other words, he's saying there's going to be a lot of borrowing happening, and it's already happening now, and we know that a lot of us are really interested in Tizé or the music that's coming out of the Iona community or the importance of having a spiritual friend which is deeply rooted in Celtic spirituality or spiritual directors or Lectio Divina or et cetera, et cetera. There's in a, in where, where the churches are finding each other on the margins, they're realizing that we don't have the energy we don't have the freedom, we don't have the ma biblical mandate to continue our warring against each other or our neglect of each other, but actually it's the time that we can more openly give and receive gifts. And we'll need those gifts if we want to survive. Uh, or be uh, said in another way, if we want to be faithful in our, in our witness. And, um, you know, I think we've emphasized here, there's we can be confident that we too have a gift to bring to the table, that we can be proud of and say there are, there's a reason why we continue to be Anabaptist and why we are Mennonite, uh, making us less defensive uh, or suspicious of other traditions. And in this case, Snyder does a very good job at saying, you know, what we have is just didn't drop out of heaven. This has long roots throughout the Middle Ages. And, and there's so much of, mi uh, of medieval uh, Catholic spirituality that we just sort of dumped overboard in this whole process of, of cleaning um, the deck uh, uh, in the 16th century. And it's, it's time that we can bring back some of those other um, uh, traditions and, and uh, be enriched by them. And so I would also um, uh, say yes and amen to that. And, I, and I've been, I'm in an evangelical seminary now, but I've studied at a Lutheran seminary, a uh, Catholic seminary, um, at the Canadian Council of Churches. I'm involved with Orthodox, 
I've had a, I've had a wonderful experience with a student who is, who is uh, Egyptian Coptic and been enriched, deeply enriched, by all of those kinds of ecumenical contacts. contacts. And I think um, uh, that's another area for us to explore and to be enriched by. And, and in many of your congregations, that's already happening. So um, we want to go home to, we want to go with some take-homes today. And um, that'll, we're going to try and, and, and tease some of these things out with a shorter table conversation again and then um, open mic. And I'm glad a number of you came to me during the break and uh, pointed back to the Augsburger book. And uh, some people told me they really liked it, Marianne. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, no, uh, no, yes, actually. <laughs> um, but the question was, okay, here we have these seven practices. What does that look like on the ground when we're working with our youth and we're doing uh, what used to be called catechism classes? Um, there are aspects that might be missing there. What, what, how do we address this widespread biblical illiteracy? Uh, these are practices. Does it involve theological thinking? Um, but, but, but the, but the um, basic question, what does this look like on the ground? And, and uh, uh, Ruth Beam and Jim Brown, Brown and, and uh, Scott Brubaker's there, uh, three that sort of brought this up. Um, and I'd, and I'd, like to, I'd like to make this the theme of our, of our round table discussion. Would either of you want to add something more specific that, that I might have overlooked that you mentioned in our conversations? Scott? Or? Uh, I think that my sense is that we're often mindful of the ideals, and these seem highly idealistic. Um, but what we're not so good on is the how. Right? What, you know, where does one get the desire or the motivation for these idealistic practices, uh, for a countercultural life? Um, what do we do with failure, you know, and how do we admit that we're not a whole lot different? You know, you know, how stubbornly loyal are we to our congregations? And how do we, how do we work at that sort of on a nitty-gritty level when it comes to how do we speak with each other about hockey practice on Sunday morning? Is that part of the conversation or what, what's all included in it. Um, but I guess I'm interested in where we get, you know, where we get the spiritual nourishment or power to live differently than the, the wider society, to live in this new kingdom way, which is really not easy. So where do we get this <coughs> power from. Yeah, good. So on the one hand, we're, we're saying, or Augsburger's saying, this has been our tradition. In some, in some respects, I think we can say perhaps ideals, but we've, we've done some things in our longer uh, 400, 500 year tradition to embody these, or uh, pra these practices helped us to embody our understanding of the gospel. And it gets back to this Rockway question that we had, you know, how do we get that, how do, how do we articulate that in language that we feel comfortable with today? And what practices that reflect these commitments are, are appropriate, or practices that, that fuel these kinds of commitments are, are the right ones for this time and this place. And we've talked a little bit about how this time and place is unique. And um, um, so it's not just information that we want to share. 
and certainly ideals are, are, are problems as well. Um, somehow getting to practices that shape habits, that shape identity. Um, you know, any other sort of, so this is what we want to, we want to talk about, especially as you do your nurturing, your, your mentoring, your, your discipling uh, as leaders in your congregations. Someone else want to add a question or a comment as we uh, prepare to think about this a little bit more? Um, yeah, I guess just in a nutshell to ask, what would it look like to, to build faith classes based on practices rather than on an intellectual, theological menu? Yeah. <coughs> so, um, and I'll give you one concrete example from Alan Kreider on, on some of this. That might connect to your comment too, Scott. <clears throat> Alan Kreider, he has a little study on, uh, on conversion in, in, in the church's, um, the early church's understanding of conversion. And, he's, and he said, um, baptismal candidates weren't even allowed in worship services for the first, I think he said, two or three years. They first had to show that they were going into prisons and visiting with the imprisoned. They came from wealthy families. They had to show that they were giving up their wealth and giving it to the poor and living simply. They had to do all these things that, that reflect Jesus in their lives. And then they could come to a worship service and then they could become baptized. And all of this was done very strategically in a context of at times persecution because if you're going to take the take the step of baptism, you also have to be serious enough to realize that that could also mean martyrdom. Right? So, and, and it wasn't going to happen until you showed some real significant practices that have become habits that have shaped your identity. And then you will be baptized. Right? So, Jim, in terms of a, a membership class around practices, you know, what could that look like today? What kind of practices that would uh, allow them to uh, become more like Jesus? And then, of course, the argument is it's our practices that fuel, this comes to Ruth's question, that fuel our thinking. That's an old theological tradition that it's through prayer uh, and faith that understanding comes. So it's as you jump into the water, as you take the step and do some of these practices that the theological reflection will, will happen. Uh, Heather. <clears throat> I'm also wondering if we should not um, be thinking about um, the, the family, the human family, because the church family is a grouping of human families and what practices do we, uh, should we be demonstrating to our kids because, um, you know, don't, don't tell me, show me, show me with what you're doing that, that it's meaningful to you that I should want to do that. Good, so I think we've got enough ideas on the table now. We've talked about in the past how maybe other generations have embodied uh, the vision, this Anabaptist vision, and it shaped them to become the people that they were. Um, uh, and we've also looked at who we are now. And uh, these are being recommended out of our own background. What might that look like on the ground for our congregations as we uh, and Jim's got a great sort of uh, uh, creative idea of doing maybe membership classes differently. Let's talk about this at our tables and see what we come up with. So some, something that we can take, take home and share with the, lar with, with the larger group.